Good day, one and all. Greetings. This is Susan Kabarowski from the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear and the steering group chair for IFNEC. I welcome one and all to this webinar on a very important topic of multinational repositories. This concept of multinational repositories is one of several ways that we can responsibly manage the spent fuel that's a result of the very important use of nuclear energy. Nuclear energy being one of the most highly regulated, safe, and secure ways to produce electricity reminds us that dealing with the spent fuel product is an important part of that cycle and being able to utilize the precious energy that we receive from nuclear power. And so the Nuclear Fuels Working Group of the IFNEC, the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, is an important element for us to remember and think about the options that we have in managing spent fuel systems. And so today's webinar, I hope will not be just us preaching to the choir, but rather providing some information about one important concept for how the world can manage its spent fuel resources. So with that, I turn this webinar over to our co-chair for the Reliable Nuclear Fuels Working Group, Tomas, and I'd also like to remind you all to please keep in touch with us on our IFNEC website and at underscore IFNEC Twitter to watch for upcoming events. Our next big planned event will be IFNEC Week in Mombasa, Kenya, November 9 through 11. So with that, I'll turn it over to our co-chair Tomas to kick off this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Uh, my name is Tomas Jagar. I'm the IFNEC Reliable Nuclear Fuel Service Working Group Co-Chair and also President of Nuclear Society of Slovenia. And today I'm really honored to be able to moderate this webinar that I believe you will find both interesting and relevant. Let me begin by extending first really thanks to the IFNEC Leadership Council and in particular to you, uh, Susie, for providing us this platform for discussing the important topic of cooperation on the back end of fuel cycle. I would also like to thank our expert panelists who gave their time to developing presentation and in addition participating in what we expect will be a lively panel question and answer discussion to close the webinar. As mentioned before the International Forum for Nuclear Energy Cooperation has 65 member countries and four observer organizations and also it has three working groups. Um, and this webinar is sponsored by one of the working groups, namely the Reliable Nuclear Fuel Service Working Group. Our working group has 20 member countries and three observer organizations that include IAEA, who is, I hope, will be also joining us today. For the past several years, this working group has explored issues involving shared solutions to the challenges of managing and disposing of spent fuel, or some call it used fuel depending on your country's perspective. We know that for some countries, spent fuel is a waste. For some countries, it is useful resource. resource. But in both ways, final geological disposal capability for high-level radioactive waste originating from used fuel is still needed. In the following presentations, you will hear about the work of our working group. That work over the past several years has focused on the importance of providing nuclear power countries, particularly those with more programs, with options for the management and disposal of spent fuel and high level waste coming from used fuel reprocessing. Whether they be partnerships, commercial offerings, or fuel leasing, or even take back programs, those potential options will necessarily require the development of a repository for the disposal of spent fuel from multiple countries. We refer to this as multinational repository. This is not a new concept. It was discussed before and it's continuously studied. And our experts and members of our working group alike, we all understand that there are different views on the multinational repository concept, with some concern that multinational repository concept might detract from progress on national repository programs. We recognize this concern a few years ago and as you will also hear in our expert presentations, we are approaching to this problem with the adoption of the dual track approach. 
The World Track approach specifically acknowledges the importance of progressing with the national repository program, while at the same time supporting international efforts to develop shared solutions to the challenges of the back end, such as multinational repository. And so we'll also come to our last presentation, which will be from Slovenia, where you will hear about Slovenia national policy as an example of country where the dual track approach is implemented in national program. Before I close my remarks, uh, I would also like to note that forums like this webinar are really essential to increasing understanding and encouraging the dialogue on cooperation that is needed to make progress on this important concept in the back end area. In the context of the past five IFNEC webinars on the SMRs, which were held last month, and those webinars predicted deployment of SMRs to a number of new emerging countries, I think that multinational cooperation on the back end is even more important and is becoming even more relevant. Before I recognize our first speaker, I would like to talk shortly about how this webinar will technically proceed. I will briefly introduce each presenter. They will have each 10 to 12 minutes for presenting their topic. Following the presentations, we will open it up to our panel discussion, where we'll also answer interesting questions that you might have submitted. The questions are already open and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions, also during the presentation. This is also an opportunity to provide observations and comments that will be reviewed by the working group later. We encourage all to participate through this function. We will monitor the submission and answer some of your questions, hopefully within the panel, but we promise that for all questions that are left unanswered, we will provide written uh, answers, uh, and those written answers will be later published as a webinar record on the IFNEC website. On the IFNEC website, it will be also the recording of this uh, webinar uh, available, and also all the slides presented during the webinar will be provided on the IFNEC homepage. So with this, uh, I conclude my opening remarks and I would give my official heads up to our first speaker. Our Good first speaker uh, will be Sean Tyson. It's my colleague, my co-chair from the United States. And let me say just a few words about his background. Sean was co-chair for the Reliable Nuclear Fuel Service Working Group for some years, and he serves in the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Nuclear Energy, where he has supported international nuclear non-proliferation and safety initiatives, including the U.S. take-back program of Oregon Research Reactor Fuel and cooperative activities to improve the safety and security of nuclear material in North Korea and Russia. More recently, Mr. Tyson has worked with international partners to explore potential opportunities for multinational cooperation on the disposal of spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste. So, Sean, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tomasz. Uh, good morning, all. I'll be speaking today about the rationale for a multinational repository. Uh, but before I begin, I wanted to make a brief announcement, which is the uh, U.S. Department of Energy and Jordan have agreed to conduct a case study on a dual track approach involving Jordan specifically. Uh, this study will be conducted over the course of a year and will examine uh, the uh, actions that uh, Jordan will want to take in order to participate in a multinational repository project, either as a sponsor or as a customer. Uh, the US delegation will be sending an invitation to members of IFNEC shortly to invite you to participate in this study if you like. Thank you. All right, so to continue, next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, many countries have small nuclear power programs or planning small programs that generate relatively small amounts of spent fuel and are high level waste. Uh, this is evident in uh, Eastern Europe, the Balkan, uh, excuse me, the Baltic states, uh, through uh, Asia and other parts of the world. The number of such countries, uh, judging by existing conversations, is expected to increase significantly over time. This will increase the number of small programs and accordingly, 
it'll increase the number of small inventories of spent nuclear fuel and high level waste. The international consensus at this time is that the only final day safe disposition plant path for a high level waste spent nuclear fuel will end with disposal in a geologic repository. Next slide, please. This is a chart that we developed in the department uh, a couple years ago, which shows the amount of spent fuel stored by country. Uh, I think this is a, dramatically indicates that while there are a small number of countries with large inventories, there are a very large number of countries already with small inventories. All of these inventories will need to be stored uh, underground or they will need to be otherwise addressed. But at some point, you will require geologic disposition for spent fuel or high level waste. Next slide, please. Uh, in our discussions with uh, other countries around the world, the department has identified a number that have either existing small inventories or as they begin to develop their nuclear programs, will start to accumulate spent nuclear fuel and high level waste. Uh, we believe that this uh, trend could be uh, enhanced by the introduction of SMR technology. Uh, since SMRs, uh, as by design, do generate less spent nuclear fuel than large full-size reactors, uh, it could be expected that countries that are planning on developing or using this technology will accumulate small, small inventories, and this could change this graph dramatically. Uh, next slide, please. So. For many countries with small nuclear programs and for future such countries, the optimal geological conditions uh, may not exist. They may lack financial and human resources to execute a repository program. And in addition, the finances will be uh, challenging. Uh, therefore, such countries will likely look for other solutions in the short term. Uh, they will continue managing their responsibilities for the dis, uh, safe storage of spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste in the long term. Uh, while they're not currently in a position to build and operate a geologic repository, they may become more open to the idea of working with partner countries to develop a multinational repository. Furthermore, countries considering the introduction of nuclear power will proceed with planning based on the expectation of extended interim storage, and in developing tenders that will favor any opportunities that may include takeaway. Next slide, please. So, uh, by considering the MNR concept, either as a dual track approach, by considering multinational options while developing their own national program, uh, countries can consider the possibility of optimizing economic resources between countries and incorporating international expertise and experience from partner countries. Uh, in addition, they can contribute to a uh, reduction in the risk of proliferation through consolidated storage, as well as transparency for the whole community. Next slide, please. In recent years, uh, the international community has worked in a, a wide variety of fora to consider and explore the concept of multinational repositories. Obviously, uh, within IFNEC, we've been looking at this for approximately 10 years or so. Uh, within the joint convention, two topical meetings were held uh, to address this concept. Uh, within the IAEA, uh, INPRO in particular, uh, there is an ongoing study looking at cooperation on the back end of the fuel cycle. Uh, the European Repository Development Organization Working Group, under uh, the, uh, the leadership of several uh, individuals, including Charles McCombie, uh, has been looking at this issue for a long time. And uh, in addition, uh, in September, uh, there will be a conference uh, on the Nuclear Energy for New Europe 2020 in Slovenia, and there will be a panel discussion that will consider this issue as well. Next slide, please. All right, 
work that's been conducted in the past. Within IFNEC, in 2009, the IFNEC Executive Committee, as one of its first actions, directed the RNFSWG to explore back-end fuel services concepts. Over time, this has gone from looking uh, from a comprehensive approach, including the entire fuel cycle, to more recently focusing on the back end of the fuel cycle, uh, where there are not um, uh, ex uh, there are not in place any disposal services uh, that are available to the international community. Uh, in 2012, the executive committee approved the RNFS uh, discussion paper on the comprehensive fuel services leading to the 2014 workshop in Romania with both government and industry participation. Within this discussion, uh, industry indicated that the front end uh, works fine. There are services available for the international community uh, for all aspects of the fuel cycle. Uh, however, on the back end, uh, disposal services do not currently exist. Uh, and as a result, industry indicated that government should take the lead on that discussion, and they will, of course, support it at such time as countries uh, develop agreements. In 2016, the RNFSWG published a report on practical considerations to begin resolving the final spent fuel disposal pathway for countries with small nuclear. We refer to this as the dual track approach. And in brief, this report examines how countries can examine options for cooperating with other countries on disposal while at the same time uh, pursuing a national program. And lastly, in 2019, uh, there is a uh, financial workshop in Paris, uh, which we followed up with a session last November in Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. So within the IEA in uh, 2013, uh, members uh, organized a topical meeting which addressed issues involving back-end services and MNRs uh, with, in the context of the joint convention and members' obligations. In 2015, we led a session at the IEA and INPRO Dialogue Forum to address issues involving the transfer responsibility. In 2016, the IEA supported a second topical meeting to address issues involving cooperation on SNF and high-level waste disposal on the joint convention. Lastly, in 2017 to the present, we are again conducting a study on cooperative approaches to the back end of the fuel cycle. In addition, the IEA has published numerous reports and studies involving the MNR concept. Next slide, please. In conclusion, for countries planning or operating small nuclear programs, the multinational repository would present an important opportunity for addressing their challenges, be it siting, be it finances, be it technical expertise. By providing a back-end solution that can support future energy development, uh, the MNR approach is a viable option for both the nuclear industry and potentially the growth of clean energy by supporting consolidation of resources and uh, challenges. Lastly, in an interest in the MNR concept continues to grow, and the continued dialogue involving international regional organizations can only contribute to the future development of MNR. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for this introduction in the past work and our contributions. Uh, and now we will turn to uh, our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Christophe Seri uh, from IAEA. Uh, and he will uh, speak about the use of international energy, um, international agency for atomic energy view on the multinational concepts. Christophe is the director of the IAEA division of nuclear fuel cycle and waste technology and has more than 25 years of experience in the nuclear field. With his focus on nuclear fuel cycle and waste management. Prior to his appointment to the IAEA, he served as vice president of Mitsubishi Nuclear Fuel, where he was also involved in handling the consequences of the earthquake and tsunami of March 2011, and as a counselor of nuclear affairs to the French embassy in Japan in Mongolia. 
Christoph, with uh, this, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, good morning for those who are on the uh, west of, uh, um, of Vienna. Good uh, afternoon for uh, all the others one. And um, can I get maybe the next slide, please? So I guess you heard already the word IEA several times, just to uh, put things in perspective, I'm sure you know that. We have been established in 1957, so we're a bit more than 60 years old. We currently have 171 member states with uh, around 2,500 staff from more than 100 countries. So IAEA means International Atomic Energy Agency, and our motto is Atoms for Peace and Development. So one important part of the peace part is safeguards and verification that nuclear material used for peaceful purpose remains for peaceful purpose. In terms of uh, your development, uh, yeah, we are uh, yeah, publishing safety standards and the uh, yeah, security guide, which are the consensus of our member states. And we are also uh, facilitating information exchange and dissemination uh, yeah, in the field of science and technology one of them being uh, nuclear power. Next slide. So when it comes to uh, uh, final waste management, so the joint convention is something which is, and uh, where the agency has a secretariat, but it's also something which is a, um, a relationship between member states. So sometimes people ask me, can I change the joint convention? And I tell them, don't talk to me. And uh, it's for the member state to decide whether they want to change something or not. It's not for the agency to decide. So what do we have with the joint convention on the uh, safe management of uh, waste and, uh, um, and spent fuel when it comes to multinational repository? So radioactive waste, as you can read, is compatible with safety management, of course. And uh, is in principle be disposed in the state in which it was generated. However, in certain circumstances, and, um, it could be uh, done in another country among contracting parties to use facilities in one of them for the benefit of the other parties, which means that uh, it's absolutely not forbidden uh, to consider multinational repositories. So there is a specific case here, particularly where waste originated from joint projects, and yeah, but it's just one example. So multinational repository and yeah, can be one part of a national policy. Next one. So the agency and yeah, has and yeah, worked and yeah, yeah, on this and yeah, aspect. So I think it was mentioned previously, and yeah, including the work of IMPRO. So IMPRO is something which is more looking at uh, yeah, yeah, what could be the future development of nuclear energy. I mean, as they started uh, yeah, more than 20 years ago, future is already close to now, but they are still working on uh, yeah, these topics. And uh, the first document that uh, yeah, the, uh, the agency published uh, yeah, on the topic date from 1998. So as you can see, it's not something which is new on our agenda. Our agenda is, of course, driven by the interest of member states. So in between, we have uh, yeah, yeah, had several additional publications addressing specifically uh, yeah, how that could work from a technical point of view, from an institutional point of view, and uh, yeah, whether we're talking about storage or uh, yeah, um, final disposal. So you can see your 98, 2004, 2005, 6, 2011. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I can introduce the last one we have published, which is 2016, which is going into more details of how you could work on a cooperation scenario. Cooperation being two countries which both have waste to uh, dispose of and willing to work together by opposition of a scenario where you will have a host country who has absolutely nothing to dispose of and other countries which would be customers. So here in our cooperation, we both need to, uh, to dispose of, the, of some waste and we want to do that together. Uh, we are to the, today focusing on uh, high level waste. And, uh, however, the concept of multinational cooperation is here for the run of radioactive waste repository. So it can also be implemented and, uh, for a uh, medium or low level waste if there is a, a joint interest of two countries. So 
we have chapters on that on risk management and also on the different things that you need to work on technical financial institutional social political obviously and yes the government is part of it but it's not the only one and, um, and uh, there is a conclusion that technical and economic challenges and uh, may be more easily addressed by multinational partners by than by a single one especially when we are talking about relatively small inventories so all these publications including this one are available free of charge on the website of the agency next slide please so sometimes we receive many questions when we start to say multinational repository and yeah, we sometimes the question but is a repository possible yes it is and, uh, and it is the basis of most of national programs to go to an uh, underground repository. We are currently uh, three what we call front runners, Finland, Sweden and France, and, uh, which are basically at the uh, last stage uh, before really operation. So Finland receives a uh, construction license already. So uh, we expect a uh, start of uh, uh, operation uh, in the coming uh, one or two years. Sweden and France are the last step of the uh, construction license. So if I take uh, 2025, we'll have at least one geological disposal in active operation and by 2030, at least three. In addition to the front runners, many countries are progressing and moving. I cannot uh, mention all of them, but uh, just to give one or two examples, uh, China is uh, starting an uh, underground research uh, facility. Switzerland is also well advanced, and um, Japan uh, has uh, restarted three years ago uh, uh, the process. Just to give three examples in uh, three different uh, locations, and uh, so there is a, a pack of uh, countries which are just behind the uh, the front runners. So yes, it is feasible, and that's uh, that's a real option to use geological disposal. Next slide, please. So just as a transition, because sometimes we also ask the question, uh, can we transport spent fuel from one country to another? Uh, it's not the topic I uh, want to um, insist here, but the answer is yes. As part of uh, your reprocessing and recycling, there are two reprocessing plants in Europe, one in UK and one in uh, France, and they have received uh, more than uh, 3,000 tons of spent fuel coming from Europe and Japan. So transporting spent fuel from one place to another, or transporting high level waste from one place to another is also something and which is uh, uh, already well proven. And uh, the agency has uh, spent a uh, significant amount of work on uh, the development of uh, uh, dis disposal of uh, uh, deep geological repositories and we have published or are in the wake of publishing several uh, reference documents both on concept and generic design process on roadmap to implementing a program from inception to post closure so here you will ask me uh, uh, is that adapted to multinational repositories the answer is it's generic but most of it, I would say 90% of it, would be the same whether you are on a national program or on a multinational program. And uh, we have worked on a uh, method to estimate disposal program costs, which would also be something important if you go to multinational repositories. And, um, and we have uh, put together a compendium of uh, available results and characterization so that someone who wants to start next in, uh, an underground repository can benefit from the work done before and we did also specific work on stakeholders involvement and yeah, so through the life cycle of nuclear facilities and, and yeah, with information sharing for the specific questions which are raising with a disposal in addition to that which are mainly your and your publications so we have e-learning materials and we have also a professional network which is the underground research facility network where professionals can uh, share experience and, and knowledge on uh, the topic. Next slide, please. We have also published safety standards uh, specific to disposal. And here again, 90% uh, yeah, of what is, what is in it could be readily 
available for implementation of a multinational repository. And it's a good thing that uh, yeah, we have a common, fully agreed set of safety standards for repositories that would certainly help uh, yeah, yeah, going to multinational solutions if uh, several countries wishes to do so. Next. Some things that is a little bit less known because obviously uh, yeah, small inventories and uh, yeah, is commonplace. And I think one of the graphs we showed at the beginning of the webinars is uh, yeah, showing that. So there are still going underground. There are some other concepts which are uh, yeah, considered, which are not as mature yet as an uh, yeah, underground uh, yeah, repository. And some of them may or may not and you go forward and you have deep bohole disposal, deep horizontal bohole disposal, converting minings. And uh, so if those things become successful, it will give more option to a small program in addition to multinational repositories. Now, all those trees are currently at the uh, say beginning stage and, uh, of, uh, of research. Next slide, please. Christophe, one minute. Yeah. And uh, so I, uh, I will not come too much on what the agency is doing on the MNR. A uh, dual and track approach uh, was mentioned, and for us, it's very important that whatever is done, keep as an option the national program because you don't know what happened. And working together could be up to joint disposal. But even if you work together on a multinational project, at the beginning of it, it can still benefit and be an economic of say, scale for the development of your national project. And uh, you're going quickly to the last slide. Yeah, and, uh, so as a uh, UN organization, and uh, we cannot fully take initiative, we need to listen to member states, but uh, if there are enough member states willing to work on this topic, we're happy to do that as we did in the past. So we are happy to remain engaged. We're happy to have been invited by IFNEC to be part of this uh, seminar. We'll be happy to support and catalyze more discussion between the uh, member states and uh, even lead specific topics or analysis. And uh, if we have enough requested requests from member states, we have a conference on radioactive waste management scheduled in November 2021. And uh, the topic of uh, international cooperation for waste management and disposal will be one of the track. And I think my last slide is just to say how happy we are to uh, cooperate with the uh, um, RNFSC and uh, your working group. And uh, we think this is a very useful work. And uh, there are well things which can be discussed effectively within the working group. And uh, yeah, maybe later on, when they are started to be matured, and uh, be put to the agency to, uh, for further uh, 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 work. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have slightly overrun my time. Uh, thank you, Christophe. It was uh, very interesting uh, to give an overview of the past. And now we will also move to the future, because with our next speaker, uh, we will. Uh, Listen for, to Alan Brownstein, uh, um, his perspectives about the future. Alan uh, is independent strategic and technical advisor on radioactive waste management programs. He served in the US Department of Energy for over 35 years. And this work included also work that was very important to supporting and guiding the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, Reliable Nuclear Fuel Service Working Group. He served for many years as co-chair in this in our working group. Before that, he also worked for 25 years with the Yakima project, where he was the chief operating officer. Alan, please. Alan, you're on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Now it's fine. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate Alan. that. <laughs> You know, um, I've been involved in, in, in national, international repository issues for, for a very long time. And, and so when I was thinking about the perspectives on the future, I, I look back at the last, oh, 10, 20 years, uh, even further, and multinational repositories uh, back in the old days were um, 
not looked upon very favorably, certainly by countries that were developing um, their national uh, programs because uh, multinational repositories were viewed as a sort of a threat to the, uh, to the national repositories. And, and so, you know, in trying to look at the future, I, I went backwards and, and looked at how far we've come. Um, and, and so I'm reminded of that. So I wanted to do three things today. I wanted to, you know, take a look at what I consider, you know, what, what the, what's the current, the key current state of affairs uh, with MNRs. Uh, you know, what, what are the critical uh, events uh, that led from uh, a, a time not so long ago that people shied away um, very actively from, from those discussions? And then I want to take a look at how I see the current state of play influencing the future uh, of MNRs. And finally, the third thing I want to do is, is take a look at, at what I consider the key drivers uh, that can lead to um, an optimistic future uh, for the MNRs. So that's, 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 those are the three uh, purposes I have today. So if we can go to the first slide. So these are the, these are the five things that, that, uh, that I wanted to point out. Uh, while sh shared solutions to the back end are recognized as beneficial for economic, safety, security, and environmental reasons, no country today is considering uh, the possibility of accepting uh, fuel uh, from another country for disposal. National programs are a high priority and developing MNRs <clears throat> should not impact uh, progress that is being made on the national programs. The safety case for deep geological disposal has been successfully demonstrated in many regulatory settings and will soon be demonstrated through actual operations. Uh, as, uh, as in Finland. And this becomes important when we, when we start looking at the future. Um, as has been talked about in, in the previous two presentations, the interest in the MNR concept, <clears throat> certainly over the past 10 years, has continued to grow. Studies from the IAEA, from IRIO, and from IFNIC. And the national policy of pursuing the development of a national program, while at the same time supporting the creation of shared solutions for the back end has been adopted by several countries. This is as Tomas talked about, uh, the dual track approach. We go to the next slide. So let me, let me now move on to, <clears throat> from the current state to observations about uh, the, the future. <clears throat> now, notwithstanding the progress in Finland um, and, and uh, Sweden and, and France, it remains a daunting undertaking for small programs or emerging countries to develop their own geologic repository for uh, disposal. And shared solutions continue to represent an effort worth pursuing. Further development of the MNR concept can constructively occur while progress is being made on several national repositories. Um, and uh, we talked about the dual track approach. <clears throat> One thing that's been mentioned, I think Sean mentioned this before, but um, when Tomas and I were co-chairs of the uh, working group, we put out this study in 2016, which is practical considerations to begin resolving uh, the spent fuel disposal pathway for countries with small nuclear programs. And um, that, that report really identified very important activities that small countries can take today uh, low-cost efforts uh, to further progress towards an MNR, <clears throat> and and that really is a, is an important study that I urge uh, smaller countries to take a look at because I think it can be very helpful. <clears throat> the economic case for the MNRs has been demonstrated, uh, but the benefits uh, beyond uh, economics uh, have not been fully explored, and little progress has been made on how a country they best present and develop the idea for such considerations. And I'll talk about this for the future. We go to the next slide. Given that some countries are actively moving forward with their national repository programs, <clears throat> it is unlikely that an MNR will proceed in advance of completing and operating a national repository. However, the existence of, uh, of an, uh, re an operational disposal facilities will enhance 
the acceptance of future repositories, both nationally and internationally. And that's an important point. Um, <clears throat> the MNR technical challenges will not substantively differ from a national repository, but the social, institutional, and legal issues are going to be very much more complex. And while there's a need um, from, uh, from existing and emerging small countries for an MNR, this may be a little bit controversial. Demand associated with any urgency will likely not be the driving factor given the availability of cost and safety of long-term disposal alternatives. Uh, political and uh, public and political requirements for a credible solution um, will be more important. So having accomplished the first two objectives, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to uh, the next one, if we can go to the next slide. Why I think given all this information and given all this history of the last 20 years, why I think there's reasons to be optimistic about the future uh, uh, for the MNRs. First is climate change. Without an expanding nuclear industry, the ability to meet a low carbon future will be much more limited. Uh, and with more nuclear plants and more emerging nuclear countries, the need for disposal options will increase. Second is the future of the nuclear industry itself. Continuing recognition of the ability to continue to build reactors may be limited without a clear path forward for spent fuel. Um, and we've seen that in, in, in many countries considering uh, building reactors. Um, but that's not limited to, to smaller countries. I think every country is <clears throat> continuing to uh, see this. And, and, uh, and, and so for the nuclear industry to continue to flourish, um, not dealing with the back end uh, becomes critical. <clears throat> My third point on why I, I, I think there's reasons for uh, optimism is, is the transition of repositories for a first of a kind project. As national repositories transition from plans to actual operations, shared solutions will attract additional interest, and MNRs are likely to be viewed uh, as an acceptable business opportunity. Um, first plants of any kind are always tough. Uh, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, it, 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 uh, it becomes just a normal business operation. Now this will never become just a normal business operation, but um, yeah, it, it certainly will become easier uh, after national repositories are successfully uh, operating. <clears throat> um, another point I wanted to build on, which I said in the previous slide, that that um, demand is not going to be the driving factor. It's it's the it's the social and political considerations. And what I see going on now, and, and uh, I know um, uh, Charles will talk about this too, but I see that there's been increased focus on the, on the benefits and incentives for hosting MNR. Um, IEA, INPRO, IFNEC, the working group, ARIUS are developing new efforts to examine the benefits and, and incentives. And, and that, that becomes uh, critically important for MNR because it's, it's, it's the uh, political and social uh, issues uh, that uh, uh, are gonna be a real challenge. <clears throat> Let me go to uh, the next slide and, and the fifth reason. Um, uh, no, if we can go back one. There's an, a slide, should be a slide in the middle. No? Okay, we'll just, just leave it there. Um, let me go on with, with the reasons why I, I believe there's an optimistic uh, future for the MNRs. Um, and, and that is the dual track approach <clears throat> over the last 10 years has continued to make progress. Individual countries, certainly uh, Slovenia leading the way, but the Netherlands and Denmark, um, and international organizations um, um, you know, beginning to focus uh, on, on the dual track approach. And, and the last is I'm going to go to what most of you are probably familiar with is the, is the South Australian uh, <clears throat> experience. 
They recently explored the business case uh, for considering um, importing uh, spent fuel. Um, and uh, that, that um, was significant, regardless of the result um, that, that, that they didn't proceed uh, at this time. Uh, the postmortem was not that this will never be raised again, but rather it served um, as a dialogue uh, on the public and political process and what might be done differently in the future. And that was an important, uh, what I drew as an important lesson from South Australia. They made a strong business case, um, but that was not sufficient. And, uh, I mean, okay, thank you. So that, let me go to the last slide. That, that was the, the, uh, the three major points I wanted to, to raise. Uh, so let me just add my concluding thoughts. Much has been written about the challenges of developing an MNR, and those challenges are very real. But so is the fact that those challenges can and likely will be overcome. One day, countries that generate nuclear power will have options involving shared solutions for addressing the challenges of the back end of the fuel cycle. And finally, um, something that um, certainly drove me for the last 35 years in working in this and, and, and I consider you know, absolutely crucial, is that spent nuclear fuel should not be left to the future generations uh, when this generation has the technical and economic means to solve the problem. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and now from your vision of the future, we will move to a presentation of Charles McCombie. He's also one of the people with a lot of experience in this field and that it's sometimes the problems are not so much technical, but as he has here incentive questions. And uh, so before I give floor to Charles, let me just introduce him briefly. Uh, Dr. Charles McComb is president of the Arius Association and he's also the secretariat, uh, he's working as the secretary of the European Deposit Working Group. Both organizations focus on enhancing multinational cooperation at the back end of the fuel cycle. He is an independent strategic and technical advisor to numerous national and international radical waste management programs. And please, Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Well, my big message today is that implementation of a multinational repository should, can, and will be a win 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 situation. Why? be a win for the many countries that would like to use a disposal service like that. It will be a win for global nuclear safety and security. And, and this is the focus of my presentation, it will be a win for any country choosing to provide this crucial back end nuclear fuel cycle service. Next. These are my one level down messages I hope you'll take home. The first message is that to guarantee this nuclear safety and security, all countries, all countries with any kind of long lived waste will have to have access to a geological disposal facility. This will only happen if there are MNRs. It won't happen by every tiny country doing it alone. If anybody, and when somebody does it, there's a potentially a large global market for this kind of disposal service. And, and this is the focus of my presentation, there are large and varied incentives for a country to provide this kind of service. And last and certainly not least, we believe the time is getting close for a potential service provider to step forward. Next. The incentives for a multinational repository are easy for the users. They are listed here. I'm not going to go through all the points on all of the slides like this, but clearly implementing a repository is difficult and expensive, and it's not necessary that every country does it. So for the users, it's easy, and therefore there's interest in this. Next. This is just an example from Europe over the past almost 20 years. There have been two major studies done that have involved 14 or 13 different countries in Europe. These stars that you see are the number of repositories that are going to have to be just in little Europe 
if we do not have a multinational repository, it's not thinkable like that. So that then why, what are the incentives then that are going to get someone to step up next? The valuable asset that can be for where steps up, the first two bullets pick out the biggest um, incentives and I'll go into more detail on these. It's economic and societal development and global influence. But there's a huge important caveat, not everybody can do it. Not any country can do it. You must have the right conditions, geological, societal, economic, and, and trust of the international community. So that um, sub bullets on the third point are very, very important. So the, this is the start of the drivers. Next, please. If you are going to have it, trying to implement the service, of course, you'll be interested in whether there is a market out there. Alan referred to this a little bit before. This is the Australian Royal Commission study, which looked at all of the potential market out there, took different um, assumptions on how much of the available spent fuel might go to such a repository, different range of assumptions, took, made assumptions on the willingness to pay, which is around a million dollars per ton. And the total revenues in the base case were 130 billion US dollars. So that there is a market there and it's a large market. Let's look at the drivers and incentives in a little bit more detail. The easy bit is the financial drivers. I've highlighted in each of these slides in deep blue the, the key points. First of all, there's just a simple income flow. That's the big, big first blue bullet. Secondly, the, there's an important point also is that your own national disposal costs will obviously be reduced by the economies of scale. In the bottom block, you can see other more creative concepts that can also be introduced if you have a multinational repository. So these are the financial drivers, next but they're not enough alone. It won't work on its own. Just like in principle, national repositories don't work purely by financial drivers. So what other drivers are there? Next. Here they are the four classes, the economic ones we've touched on. The others are societal, ethical, and political. In each of these cases, I'm gonna pick um, an example of each and not the full spectrum. Next, societal drivers are pretty obvious. There's a lot of employment involved here. You can huge infrastructure uh, improvements can be done. You can spin off lots of industries. You don't have to just dispose, you can make the casks, for example, yeah? And of course, there are these integrated project developments, which might be mostly important for developing countries because you can restore contaminated sites, you can revive your economy. So the societal drivers closely correlated with economic drivers are obviously hugely important. But the next, this is the very important driver here, Alan's referred to it. This is the ethical drivers, the reduction in global security and proliferation risk. It is not a good idea to have small amounts of sensitive nuclear materials sitting on the surface for many, many decades in many, many countries around the globe, point one. Point two is that to get to disposal is the only agreed endpoint we have. This is part of our responsibility to future generations and it will be easier to fulfill this responsibility if there is a multinational option open. Lastly, and this could become more important, this extended producer responsibility. If I sell nuclear reactors, or if I sell the fuel that goes into nuclear reactors, or if I sell uranium that goes into the fuel that goes into nuclear reactors, maybe I have some kind of responsibility to take back the residues from the usage of these. So this take back option has been used in the past and could well be an important driver in the future. But these ethical points are very, very important. Next. The last block are the political drivers, and I've singled out for 
mention the middle one is that if you're in this business then you become part of the global nuclear scene you have discussions you have multilateral lateral and bilateral contracts and agreements you can make with many countries around the world and this could be an important driver at the political level and much of these considerations are driven by politics so these are very quickly the drivers that are out there next they've been looked at in this past going way back more than 20 years to the Pangea project that some of the very old people will remember in Australia a German study about importing or exporting um, spent fuel the Sapio work that you saw on the starred diagram of Europe the South Australian very detailed project that Alan mentioned have all been done up to recent times and ongoing there is still um, a range of different um, initiatives projects studies going on as mentioned in the bottom of these three blocks yeah the next slide the first is something that's kind of new the Erdo working group the working group is the name and that's what it is is an informal although highly organized group which has been in discussion since 2009 and nine on this members of the Erdo working group are allocated not by companies not by individuals but by governments actually at government level and we've been working for since 2009 now and this slide which you can look in detail later shows the incredible complex that we've been involved with and this will soon be formalized at a different level because the Erdo Association is soon to be formed with permanent staff and with an, a domicile and an office instead of being just a working group so this is what will be important so we this multinational is moving ahead how can it move ahead even faster second last slide please here's how you can help nuclear community out there first of all you've got to keep reminding people that geological disposal is safe and is necessary both aspects hugely important Firstly, and then you can also acknowledge this contribution to safety and security. The world will be a safer and more secure place with MNRs. You can confirm the robustness of the business case. Even the very robust Australian case was disputed and we all have to look at these in detail. We can so expand these discussions which have been kind of Eurocentric up until now to include other areas of the world as mentioned here. And then last and really, really important, the big guys, the big programs there can provide the moral support and if necessary, the technical support for any country agreeing to move ahead with implementation of an MNR. And the last slide, in case you haven't been listening in between, just repeats my take home messages again here. And um, I won't read them all again, just go straight to the last one. Given all of these incentives, the time is now right for a service provider to step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for this uh, really in-depth overview of the situation and with very practical hints for the faster implementation. So what can nuclear community and IFNIC is here to connect nuclear community do uh, to help support and promote this uh, concept further. Uh, with this presentation, uh, after this presentation, we will also hear one example of one country implementing World Bank, and this will be from my country, from Slovenia. So we'll go to our next speaker. And uh, Leon Kegel will present uh, how Slovenia implemented the dual track approach. Leon is the head of the planning and development section at the Slovenian Radical Waste Management Organization. He has worked for 12 years in the area of long term policy and strategy development for radical waste and spent fuel management. This work also includes long term storage and final disposal facility development with associate cost assessments. Leon, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Tomas. Good morning. And good day uh, good afternoon to everybody 
Uh, today I would like to present you uh, the Slovenian approach um, how to include a track uh, strategy into the national uh, program and policy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Slovenia uh, has a small nuclear program. Uh, we are uh, sharing one uh, nuclear power plant uh, together with uh, Croatia. It's a PVR uh, system. Uh, near to the Croatian border. We are also operating one research reactor, Triga, uh, and we decided not uh, for now to return the fuel to the United States. Uh, therefore, we will have to deal with this fuel um, as well. We are uh, now also in the final stage of getting a construction permit for the low and intermediate level waste repository uh, that I will talk a little bit later. Uh, and we are also operating one central storage facility for institutional waste and we have a, a closed uh, and remedi remediated uranium mine and two existing disposal sites uh, there. Uh, next slide please. Uh, the most important nuclear facility in Slovenia is definitely the nuclear power plant Kursko which is in co-ownership with the Republic of Croatia. Uh, Currently, the radioactive waste uh, and spent fuels managed on site. The inventory uh, is written here on the slide, but the main uh, message is that the inventory of low and intermed intermediate level waste is uh, quite small, uh, less than 2,500 uh, cubic meters. And uh, there was a question of joint disposal of this uh, type of waste uh, together with the Republic of Croatia. Uh, but after significant uh, negotiations, uh, last uh, September it was determined by a so-called intergovernmental commission that this joint disposal uh, is currently not uh, possible. Uh, that's why uh, Slovenia is uh, planning to construct a low and intermediate level waste repository very near to the power plant. Uh, probably next year we will start with the construction and the Croatia will take over the waste. So there will be a waste division and take over and they are planning to store this first, uh, which will be then followed by final disposal in 2050 in their uh, so-called uh, center for um, management of radioactive waste. Um, but uh, for the spent fuel, uh, spent fuel storage, uh, which is a wet uh, spent fuel pool is existing in the NPP. Um, and currently there is a construction of dry storage going on. And uh, for now, it's planned that, that this uh, dry storage facility will be operating uh, jointly by bo both countries in NPP at least until 2043. And uh, there are negotiations uh, that this dry storage uh, facility should be operating uh, further uh, after the cessation of the NPP. Uh, about the disposal, the high level waste and spent fuel. Uh, for now, we are planning to have a joint disposal facility, so DGR, uh, in one of the countries, so Republic of Slovenia or Croatia, and we are both uh, Republic of Slovenia and Croatia and uh, waste management organizations in those countries are participating in uh, some multinational regional initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in Slovenia, we already had uh, first national program for radioactive waste and spent uh, fuel in 2006. In 2016, uh, the second one, the second revision was adopted in the form of resolution uh, and includes uh, everything that's relevant for the management of radioactive waste and spent fuel. What is important from the, uh, uh, from the view of the multinational regional disposal is that uh, first uh, we rely on safe storage that is followed by final disposal. And we strongly believe in bilateral and international uh, cooperation in this uh, area. <clears throat> and we are definitely continuing work on joint disposal solution for high level waste and spent fuel together with Republic of Croatia. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this national program, uh, definitely dual track approach was uh, recognized and uh, included and adopted. So already mentioned, uh, first, uh, we are planning to have a dry storage facility on site, uh, NPP Kursko, that will be followed by final disposal. But in this uh, time, um, before we come to the possibility of um, 
national uh, deep uh, geological repository, we are very uh, um, uh, we are very active in this uh, international or regional uh, solutions for uh, possible uh, MNR or regional disposal options. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, first, our focus uh, is on international development. But when we move uh, further to the national plan or the time for the beginning of siting and construction of a national repository, then if there is no possible uh, international solution or regional solution for deep uh, geological disposal, then we'll definitely shift to the uh, construction and first siting of the deep geological repository, either in Slovenia or Croatia. Um, next slide, please. So why we really adopted and we were thinking about the dual track approach in Slovenia? Because uh, first we think it's, we have to ask ourselves, is it feasible that each and every country, like Charles mentioned in Europe, for example, some other areas, uh, should have a deep geological repository for really low amounts of either spent fuel or high waste. I think this is not uh, the most optimal nor economical or even safest approach. Uh, next reasons why, uh, because Slovenia is a very densely, small and densely populated uh, country uh, where the geological environment is quite active and uh, it's difficult to cite according to international standards and conditions, uh, deep geological repository. Um, and also R&D uh, and the uh, competence and capacity currently is very limited in Slovenia in this uh, area. And we are uh, responsible only for half of the inventory of high levels and spent fuel, which is uh, expected to be around 460 tons of heavy metal and only 141 tons of high level waste from the decommission of the MPP. So uh, next, please. Uh, Recently, uh, we prepared, updated, uh, reviewed uh, estimate of national uh, of costs of the national uh, deep geological repository. So the estimate for the whole inventory, Slovenia and Croatia together, is 1.14 billion euros, which is approximately um, uh, 1.36 million uh, dollars or 1.23 million uh, per tons of heavy metal and it's uh, significantly higher to uh, of course uh, compared to advanced national GGR programs. As we know from some other results of the studies like uh, here OECD NIA, uh, there's always a problem with the economy of scale for small uh, nuclear programs. That's why we strongly believe that uh, there's uh, opportunity for optimization uh, in sharing uh, either disposal solutions or predisposal uh, uh, solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, very rough and uh, conservative estimate is that uh, if five partners or nations decide to construct one uh, DGR, equally sharing investment uh, costs and contingency costs, but uh, costs uh, that are variable. Uh, on inventory uh, for operational costs, then our uh, investment to such facility would be decreased uh, approximately to 40% of if we just have a uh, deep GGR with uh, Slovenia and Croatia together. So this would then be like uh, 0 0.5 billion euros. Uh, in our case, because we have small quantities of high level waste and spent fuel, there is no almost no disposal economy of scale and uh, consequently the burden on electricity price production uh, due to assuring the adequate financing to national disposal funds in Slovenia or Croatia is uh, relatively large. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we are doing uh, regular reviews of the national uh, plans for deep geological repository. We are uh, still developing and maintaining uh, knowledge and expertise in this area. Uh, we are very active in either IEA or EU projects. We are members of the Erdo Working Group, as mentioned before. IFNEC, uh, uh, just uh, currently, uh, Thomas Jagar is one of the co-chairs of the IFNEC Re Reliable Nuclear Fuel Service Working Group. And according to our uh, resolution national program, ARAH uh, needs to monitor international development in the field of, in the field 
sorry, in the field of uh, Hala West and spent food management. Uh, next slide, please. So we understand that in any case, uh, our spent fuel and Halloween inventory will require disposal in geological repository. That's why we prepared uh, national plans together with uh, Croatia. Uh, we know that we have unfavorable geological conditions, uh, not a lot of potential locations around, and for us it will be probably difficult uh, and complex uh, to implement such a DGR uh, repository. Uh, but we see a lot of challenges here, but also opportunities uh, from the regional or multinational operation from that uh, point of view. Uh, next, please, please. The uh, next slide, please. So for now, uh, implementing this dual track approach, uh, only modest uh, resources are required uh, to first to maintain this and to follow this and promote also this uh, dual track. Uh, if, as we see, the interest for international, for regional multinational repositories is growing, we will have to adapt uh, with the new uh, plans and activities uh, according to that, and we'll have to probably intensify our work. And uh, therefore, we believe uh, that by joining forces and creating one or few best possible disposal sites, we can all solve the problem of uh, disposal of high-level waste or spent fuel uh, together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leon, for this interesting uh, overview and uh, of the situation in, in our country. I think it's very in-depth with a lot of uh, data also. Uh, so we, we came to an end uh, with all five presentations and contributions uh, and we will start a panel discussion with questions and answers. Uh, I see that we have a lot of interest uh, in, uh, in this topic. We received more than 20 questions already uh, and those questions are very diverse. They go from technical questions about uh, deep borehole, high level, low level, intermediate level. They go into legal issues. So we see uh, a lot of also ideas for maybe our next uh, working group meetings uh, and we are already planning one meeting on team of technology solutions so uh, before we go deeply and we will answer all the questions uh, either writing uh, and but here let's start a discussion among panelists because I think that also panelists have exposed some interesting questions and issues among themselves Can you just all unmute you so that we can discuss? Okay. Alan, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> can I ask Sean a question? Of course. I, I'm not sure how many people watching this will realize that the US, amongst other countries, has taken spent fuel from other countries before, in particular in the scope of your um, research reactor return program. Do you think the driving force for that was my ethical incentive that I mentioned, or were there other um, justification behind it? Actually, the uh, main driver for the U.S. spent fuel take back program was based on uh, non-proliferation considerations. Uh, the U.S. back in the 1950s or so uh, transferred a large number of uh, Triga designed uh, research reactors around the world. And uh, over time, the operators accumulated a significant amount of spent fuel, uh, which was uh, included um, a highly enriched uranium. Uh, so both as a, I suppose you could say, a service to the operators to take the disposal responsibility off their hands, but also as a proliferation 
uh, measure, non-proliferation measure, uh, the U.S. agreed to accept responsibility for the ultimate disposal of this fuel uh, in the United States. So partly, I, I think I would agree, partly an ethical issue, but I think mainly a non-proliferation measure. Thank you. This, this, give, this brings us back to a question that was also posed on the question and answers. It talks about responsibility and uh, responsibility is certainly an important driver, in my opinion, behind multinational concepts and responsibilities on the producers and also on the users, of course. Everybody has like, his own responsibility. And here we have an interesting question for, and I would like to go it to the panel with this. Why are we talking about multinational? Because all discussions at the moment around the globe are binational, bilateral, take back programs, big countries, small countries, and so on. But now we are talking about multinational. Well, Chris was speaking. I, I, I think there is a potential for multinational. I mean, it's easier to start from a binational perspective because the topic is complex. But if you look at the South Australia initiative, it was a truly a multinational initiative. They were you're talking with many, many countries in the world. And again, if I take the example of what has, do, has been done with the uh, reposting of spent fuel in the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s, 2010s, that was also something which was multinational. And uh, um, you had the uh, six or seven countries sending fuel for uh, re reprocessing to France and to UK. So the multinational dimension of spent fuel management and, um, is part of it. But it's true that at the moment, it's easier to start with the uh, bilateral cooperation. Yeah, well, of course, also the, the, the non-proliferation aspect that Sean mentioned, you know, we talked about before, that, you know, that's got to involve many countries. I mean, our concern there is that it's many countries who are going to have, who do have spent fuel sitting in, in surface storage facilities, and it will sit there for a long, long time because it will never be economic to make a repository. So the, the idea of having a multinational repository, the multinational aspect is important if you place a high emphasis on the non-proliferation and the security aspect. Yeah? I, I think it's also worth noting, which I think Charles may have alluded to, uh, the department conducted a study some years ago looking at the potential costs of uh, a multinational repository, and we found that you do achieve economies of scale as you include more reactors uh, into the equation. And so whereas two countries, uh, you'll achieve some benefit from uh, you know, putting your fuel together into one repository and developing one facility, uh, if you have five or 10 countries or more, you'll achieve much greater economies of scale if you share your resources uh, in one facility. Tomash, if I can may, uh, to share some practical example of uh, Slovenia and Croatia about the uh, joint uh, low and intermediate level waste repository that should be, let's say, a little bit easier than uh, having a joint uh, repository for high level waste or spent fuel. Uh, and the experience shows that uh, such implementation of uh, facility should be uh, in such a way that you have to cover, you know, the whole inventory of radioactive waste, not only the intermediate level waste, high level waste, because if you're talking about, for example, a small country, uh, then uh, if you just solve one part of the problem, so partially solving the problem doesn't solve the whole inventory. And then you have to do the siting for, I don't know, for low and intermediate level waste or just low level waste anyway. So, uh, it's a package of solutions, negotiations, definitely. And it should be some kind of a turnkey uh, project at the end. Uh, what was, uh, I would say, very nicely shown in the business case of South Australia. So definitely discussions, a lot of discussions uh, to uh, talk, uh, to include all possible inventory to solve this uh, question. That, that is the 
main message that was, I think, uh, uh, that is seen from the Slovenia-Croatia negotiations. But from, from uh, and I agree with, with all of you, certainly from a proliferation aspect, but when we're looking at a, you know, some of the things I pointed out, if you're going to look about uh, the future of the nuclear industry, uh, prospering nuclear industry, and if you're going to look at, at climate change issues, um, ha having, you know, uh, uh, two countries agree isn't solving the, the broader issues. So, um, um, so what, what I was trying to do was take, take, take this broader look, which, uh, which sort of demands uh, more than just just two countries. It is a multinational approach. But do you agree that from a small country or a big country, talking about multinational repository is a responsible thing? Because we have heard that you were talking, you were doing studies, technical studies and so on for a long time. Is there any progress? What is your view on the responsibility of small countries speaking up and saying this is a technical problem, we have technical solution, now this is political problem. Do we need to speak about political solution to move forward? So I have my view on, on the, talking a lot means a lot of responsibility also, but what's your view? Well, I, I think I have a hobby horse about the extended producer responsibility, of course. I have facetiously made the point in the past that if I go to my local electronic store and buy a, a, a microwave oven, it comes with instructions on how to dispose of it. If I sell a thousand megawatt nuclear power reactor to a developing country, apparently you can do that without any instructions on how to dispose of it. So these are the arguments I think might push people along the road of this extended producer responsibility argument. I, I convinced it will become more important and it will become a selling point. Even today, the countries which might conceivably take back spent fuel, I think Russia is the only country which will at least take back its own spent fuel, have a, a clear market advantage compared to other countries that, that cannot do this. Although even in this case, as Leon said, a total solution is necessary. I, I know in the past in my own second home country in Switzerland, there was talk about buying Russian fuel so that it could go back. It doesn't help if you've got some other fuel already. You need a total solution that includes all of the material that's to go into a geological repository. Leon's point is very good. I also think that uh, what was done really now in last year is that we uh, currently somehow uh, shifted our focus more towards the sharing of uh, knowledge facilities in predisposal like treatment, conditioning, and uh, not uh, I would say focusing too much on already disposal. Because we have to start probably with uh, smaller steps in uh, start and then followed by uh, steps that will lead us to the final goal, which is uh, definitely either regional, multinational, suppose whatever you call it. But it needs to progress, you know, uh, steadily and uh, towards the ultimate goal, which is uh, definitely the ge geological uh, disposal. Guys, um, I uh, see one question came in. Uh, South Australia uh, experience. And I think that probably Dr. McCombie knows perhaps most about that. He was quite involved. Uh, Charles, could you comment on uh, what was accomplished there and what happened and your perspective that you think people should understand? Yeah, well, I think it was a huge step forward because it was the first really serious example of a top down um, proposal being put forward. It was put forward at the time with political agreement on both sides of the political spectrum that this should be at least examined. And it was examined and the work that was done was really very comprehensive and uh, covered all different aspects. I think where it fell through at the end was with how to assess the results of that. Basically, uh, these um, consulting, public um, consultancy groups were set up and they were set up in such a way, I think there were three of them, it's pretty obvious one was going to say yes and one was going to say no and the other one's going to say I don't know. So the, the whole public consultation part 
I think was the least thought through part of the South Australian project. Um, but having said that, the idea, I think somebody already mentioned this, has not died in Australia. There are still people um, on different parts of the Australian community who are keen to at least assess completely what this means for Australia. Way back in the Pangaea times, there were people, including the head of the Geological Survey, the head of the National Academy of Science and so on, good, died, full-scale technical people who thought at least we should assess it seriously without taking any preliminary discussion on whether it should be done or not. So the Australian example is good and it would really be good to be analysed in particular for the business case to be analysed in more detail by people who are competent to do that. Thank you. Bob, is that okay? So let's see, I see there's a question here about the uh, study commissioned by uh, Jordan and the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be uh, an announcement from the U.S. delegation within the next week or so. But in brief, uh, Jordan has agreed to uh, work with the U.S. to identify uh, what actions it would need to take as a country to participate in a multinational disposal services uh, arrangement. And this might be uh, changes to national legislation, financing options, uh, possible uh, changes to regulations, um, looking at uh, use of national funds for an international project. Uh, so this is going to cover uh, a large number of areas. Uh, we're currently identifying the scope of the study uh, but again, we'll announce further details uh, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, this relates also to other questions which were like, are you doing just technical studies of multinational repositories or also other areas? And as uh, also Alan already said, as we discussed before, technical part is just one part and probably smaller part. And what we're embarking now is discussing this responsibility, uh, political issues, um, benefits, incentives, citing, not yet, but this is also to come. I think it's worth noting that countries can do, there's a great deal of work to be done before you embark on the actual construction of a national or a multinational repository, a great deal of work. And countries can start on that now at relatively low cost, looking at issues, which again, we expect to address in the Jordan study, uh, such as legislature, financing, what have you. Uh, these issues need to be addressed long before you begin construction. So uh, there's a lot countries can do. Um, we, we think that they should probably start on that sooner rather than later will be a challenging project regardless of how you approach it. There was an interesting question came up um, about regulation of multinational repositories. This question comes up very often because it is sometimes asserted that some country with very poor regulation might be the one that offers to do it. We have always argued against that and we're using the ar two arguments. One is that any respectable country using a multinational repository will itself insist that it is state-of-the-art repository. So that's one argument. And in fact, at one stage, Swiss law said the same thing, that if we ever exported spent fuel, then our regulator would have to give it the green light as well. The second argument, and this is where Christoph comes on this spot, is that we have also argued always that there will be some overarching regulatory control and the only body that's out there looking to be able to do it right now is in fact the IAEA. What do you think of that Christoph? Well I think the IAEA is not tasked to be an international regulator. Yes. However, <laughs> obviously, I mean, however because of safety standards as a consensus of member states I, mean, I think that's a very good way to gauge whether what is done in one country is uh, up to the standards because if you compare that to the safety standards then you know whether you are basically in line with that 
What the agency can also do is facilitate, uh, as we do already, uh, your peer reviews. Uh, yeah, so it would be easy for, uh, yeah, yeah, say, 10 countries who wish to work together uh, yeah, yeah, to ask uh, yeah, a peer review of the agency to confirm that the safety approach taken for multinational repository is in line with the safety standard, which themselves are the consensus of the uh, um, safety authorities all, all around the world. So uh, yeah, without being the regulator, we can still uh, yeah, bring a consensus safety framework and tools like peer reviews to give assurance of the uh, implement the safe safety of the uh, implementation and the design and the siting. And then and then comes this question about uh, yeah, but do you see a role for IAEA if repository international repository would be situated in international let's say territory? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it has been said several times that, uh, yeah, yeah, and I saw that also in, in the questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, what is uh, your time frame of uh, your, your geological repository? If we judge from what we see from uh, your current countries, you need between uh, your 20 and 40 years to uh, your have a site and a safety case. Then you will need to operate it for 100 years or more uh, yeah, to put things uh, yeah, inside. And then you need uh, yeah, several hundred years of uh, yeah, um, uh, monitoring after closure. Uh, yeah, when you look, look at the um, lifetime of international organization, uh, yeah, um, we are very proud that the UN is already 75 years, uh, yeah, but it's actually not sure that we will reach to uh, 100 or 150. Uh, yeah, so there are things we can do now because we're existing now, uh, but I don't think it would be reasonable to expect uh, yeah, an international organization, whether it's the agency or any other international organization, and uh, yeah, to get a commitment which may be much beyond the uh, yeah, yeah, usual life of this type of organizations. But we're happy to help now. Thank you. Thank you with this, uh, your readiness to support this movement. Uh, and I see that debate is going on. We have a lot of questions and new questions are popping all around. So we will have, have a lot of homework to do. I will reply to all the questions because our time is running up. So if you have any last round comments, I would invite panelists to say one wrap up and then we will sh slowly say goodbye. Yeah, maybe coming back onto our point, technical and political. Uh, yeah, I think technical, we know how to do. I mean, you're right on political, which is not easy. There is one missing block in the middle, and uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, the working group is trying to uh, work on that, is basically the stru structuration of such a cooperation. If you don't work on uh, the legal aspect, the liabilities, do you transfer or not the ownership of uh, your spent fuel, and uh, how you finance it, is it uh, yeah, I give you money and then you take care of it, or is it part with milestones? I think you also need that to have something which is working. If tomorrow political people say yes, and you have not solved that, you are again 10 years or 15 years until you get a solution. So I think it's important that this, I would say legal and business approach is, uh, is, is worked now so that when political conditions will be there, then you can implement quickly. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, from my long um, involvement with this kind of studies, the thing that cheers me up is that we are here today on a, a, an ethnic um, webinar about this and the, the acceptability, the respectability, the desirability of this project, of this concept has definitely increased over the years. And um, with the work that these different groups are doing that have been mentioned several times here, I see it moving forward in um, a positive way. And it might not take 40 years just because some national programs took 40 years, yeah? That's all. Alan, Leon. No, I'll just, just make one quick comment on the transfer of responsibility. Uh, there's been a lot of work actually done on that, in fact, uh, um, we had a, uh, a, a dialogue at the IAEA uh, under, under INPRO. Uh, we had a uh, session on that a number of years ago. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we reached a number of conclusions, and, and, and I have a lot of views on it. It's a very, very interesting question. Uh, the, the simple answer is eventually um, 
the, uh, the transfer of ownership has to occur completely. Uh, how and the process and the conditions under under which that concur, occurs needs to be negotiated. And there, there, there are some very interesting aspects to that. So it's an important question. But ultimately, uh, the, the answer is uh, the uh, ownership has to transfer for it to be successful. And just in closing for myself, as the co-chair of the RNFSWG, I'd like to recommend to all the members of IFNEC out there who are listening that you do get a copy of the 2016 dual track approach and take a look at section E, which outlines all the practical steps you can initiate now on developing uh, a multinational repository, participating in it. But I would also note that many of the steps are useful for a national program as well. So if you haven't uh, even scanned the report yet, I urge you to do so. Thank you. Damage, I would like to help you uh, end on a high note and just note that uh, uh, spent fuel and high level radioactive waste are not the only hazardous wastes that um, the international community has to uh, deal with and look uh, and take care of. And um, some of the more dangerous and most dangerous uh, materials are, uh, are handled quite well now through the, the uh, what's called the Basel Convention. So from the standpoint of looking forward into the future, uh, the opportunity for the international community to come up with a multinational solution to addressing uh, the, uh, this waste issue, uh, I, think, um, I think the prospects are very good given that uh, we're already taking care of very dangerous materials very satisfactorily through arrangements under that convention. Yeah, well, thank you, Bob. Uh, and we have run off of time for more discussion at the moment. Before we just break out, I would just like to remember all participants that all presentations, the video, and the question and answers will be published on the ICNEC homepage. So please visit the homepage and follow up also our working group for the future webinars, which we will certainly find uh, some themes to discuss from our questions and answers posed today. So thank you for listening and goodbye. Bye. Thank you.